Welcome everyone to another search seminar. Ben, you have 50 minutes. Take it away. Sounds good. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I, before I get started, I have to let you know that uh, this is my own research and uh, not the research of the FTC and these opinions don't reflect uh, the uh, opinions of the Federal Trade Commission or any individual commissioner. Um, apologies, as soon as I get started, I get a spam phone call on my lap work laptop. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, hazards of working from home. Uh, the other thing I should note is I have chat open on my second monitor and uh, I have built in some time for uh, questions in the talk as well as the Q&A. So please feel free to ask clarification, clarification questions or if you'd like me to go deeper on a specific point, go ahead and let me know. Um, so the basis of this project is that there's a lot of uh, various platform business models in the content creation market. Um, and what we're doing in this paper is that we're classifying these business models into three broad categories uh, and comparing them to each other in terms of profitability and uh, content design. So the three business models, uh, starting with discovery mode, uh, so the point of these platforms is are that they facilitate content discovery and they generally make money via ad revenue. Uh, so you can think of Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter as being uh, platforms that help you discover content creators. The second category is membership mode. Uh, so this is a kind of infrastructure for content creators to directly monetize viewers. Um, so they help to do this via uh, providing infrastructure for uh, providing exclusive content or infrastructure for receiving direct donations. Um, it's kind of like Shopify for content creators, but it isn't necessarily, um, it takes more of an intermediary role. Um, and so uh, our classic example for a membership platform is Patreon, but you could also think of Subbable and Substack as being in this same vein. Uh, and discovery mode and membership mode are not mutually exclusive. So our third category is hybrid mode. So this is a platform that facilitates content discovery, but also provides infrastructure for exclusive content and direct donations. Uh, and Twitch is the classic example of this. Um, you can, they have a uh, recommendations page, but you can also subscribe and provide uh, direct revenue to content creators on Twitch uh, when you're on their page. Uh, and this last mode is very important because there seems to be a broad trend towards operating in hybrid mode. Uh, so, uh, Examples of platforms moving from discovery mode to hybrid mode. Uh, in 2018, YouTube launched what they call channel membership. Uh, Facebook launched creator membership. In 2021, uh, Twitter introduced super follows. Um, and part of the reason for this is that they felt like they were in danger of becoming a promotional tools for promotional tool for Substack writers and clubhouse broadcasters. Uh, so they're trying to get uh, change their business model to get in on this direct value transfer in addition to advertising. Um, there's also examples of platforms going from membership mode to hybrid mode. So Teachable, uh, Playbook, and OnlyFans have all introduced content discovery tools uh, since they have begun business. Um, and so our questions here are, what are the trade-offs between these uh, platform business models? What are the implications for these different business models on uh, the motivations for different degrees of content design by content creators? And how do these trade-offs change when there are multiple platforms? Uh, in particular, um, one of the questions that we get at is uh, this shift towards hybrid mode is not universal. 
So Patreon is one example of a platform that does uh, intentionally does not have a discovery component. And so uh, we were curious what drives coexistence of these different business models. Uh, so a quick business preview of results. Um, with the monopoly plunge. Uh, may uh, I may I stop you there? I have a feeling I'm not quite getting what the business models are. I have a vague idea you can put me right on. It's probably good to do it now. Um, I have in mind from what you just said that the um, discovery mode is ad financed. Yes. Whereas the membership, so so viewers are consuming content, call them viewers, um, and it could be, it, it sounds like it's ad financed in discovery mode, uh, subscription financed or pay-per-view financed in membership or contribution, and then hybrid sounds to me like there's a, I don't know whether the individual content chooses ad finance or subscription or the mix. I'm, I'm relating to this uh, bit of literature in media economics about the media economics about, you know, do you do you are you ad finance or subscription finance? So I'm a bit mixed up whether the platforms allowing multiple modes on it or whether the individuals are let alone what the platform's getting out of it. But <laughs> that will come up, I'm sure I let you uh, put me right. I fear I'm off. Uh, let me provide a couple of examples. Um, so on YouTube, you, uh, YouTube is acting as a discovery platform, or it was for most of uh, the time it's been in existence up till 2018. And so the way YouTube made money was uh, that you could, uh, you searched on YouTube uh, and you also had uh, a subscriptions feed. Uh, and that helped you find content. And the way it made money was when you start a video, there's a pre-roll ad. And if the video is long enough, then there's also mid-roll ads. But it didn't have a infrastructure set up for you to va transfer value directly to a content creator. Uh, Patreon, their model is, uh, transferring value directly to a content creator in exchange for uh, specific benefits based on how much you are donating every month. So you can think of Patreon as being kind of like Kickstarter, only instead of being a one-time project-based crowdfunding platform, it's a continuous patronage-based crowdfunding platform. Uh, and the way it makes money is that it takes a commission on that value transfer from consumers or viewers to the content creator. Uh, Twitch, it has this discovery component. You'll generally see a pre-roll ad uh, before you get to see the stream. And then uh, content creators on Twitch will also take bathroom breaks uh, or other breaks during which they generally play ads. But you can also directly subscribe to a Twitch creator. And that operates basically the same as Patreon, where a uh, Twitch subscription to a uh, particular Twitch content creator will provide you with specific benefits based on whatever the content creator has uh, decided to provide. And Twitch takes a percentage commission on that uh, value transfer. The way I would classify pay TV, uh, and we're not really including this in the model, is uh, something like uh, YouTube Premium. Uh, so YouTube Premium, you pay a subscription fee directly to YouTube every month. Uh, they do transfer some of that to content creators but it's a subscription to the entire platform. And the main benefit is that you don't get ads on YouTube. There's other things bundled in with that, but I'd say that's the main reason people would subscribe. Not to belabor the question though, mm -hmm. it, it, it is odd to me that essentially you could have discovery that isn't ad financed. It's just, we don't see it because it probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but there are, a 
essentially nonprofit places, you could think about having discovery without ad revenue. And, and so I think you're defining one in terms of how you use it and the other one in terms of how they monetize it. And, and those two names are throwing me off, even though I'm okay that you're aligning the two. It just feels like one is about how they monetize. If you had ad, ad mode and membership mode, I'd be okay or discovery mode and some other term for how you do that. But it feels like you've picked one term for one and one for the other. That I think that threw me through a loop, even though the assumptions are plausible. Okay, that is good feedback. Just writing down a note here. Okay. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question, Simon. Yeah, I'm going to be wondering about how it relates to uh, the discussion in media economics, like, like magazines, how much ad finance, how much subscription. And I have in mind there's a platform up there that may be setting platform governance and setting rules. That's um, good enough to go with that if that's uh, not too far off. Yeah. Um... I, I guess the, uh, the the short answer is that we're not really addressing pay TV exactly, but it's kind of related. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, back to preview of results. Uh, that was a very good dis uh, digression. Um, so with a monopoly benchmark, um, we have a comparison of a pure discovery platform versus a hybrid platform. Uh, and we find that it is always profitable to switch from being a pure discovery platform to a hybrid platform as a monopolist. Um, so you end up with more platform profit and uh, content ends up being at least weekly more niche. Uh, and I'll define what niche versus broad means in a later slide. Uh, content ends up being weekly more niche when you go from discovery to a hybrid platform. Uh, Pure membership versus hybrid actually has uh, ambiguous comparisons for profit and content design. Uh, and the uh, act, end, uh, uh, end comparison depends on how much advertising revenue the platform gets. Uh, our main result when we go to uh, multiple platforms is that we end up with strategic business model differentiation in equilibrium. So the platforms uh, intentionally choose different business models in order to avoid direct competition. Uh, so uh, starting with the monopoly platform benchmark. Um, so uh, we have a monopoly platform, a continuum of content creators and consumers with unit demand. Uh, suppose, and we're going to start by supposing that the platform is inactive. Um, in equilibrium, all of the consumers are going to participate on the platform as are all of the content creators, um, but this forms their outside option and much of the model is the same when we go from a uh, operating without the platform to operating with the platform. Uh, so consumers, uh, this is where the search comes in, uh, consumers have Walensky style sequential search for content creators. Uh, and if they're operating outside the platform, this comes at the search cost S0 or S0. Uh, so once uh, a creator, so once a consumer has uh, paid a search cost and gotten a creator observation, uh, when consumer J inspects creator I, there's going to be a probability lambda I that is based on the uh, creator I's content design that there's going to be a match in taste between uh, the content creator and that consumer. In which case, the utility from becoming a viewer is going to be uh, B sub J uh, times, or plus uh, beta sub J and the maximum of V I minus P I and zero. Uh, so B sub J is a consumer specific utility for that creator's public content. So it's whatever content they're putting out in order to facilitate discovery. Uh, beta sub J is the price independent conditional likelihood. So conditional on 
liking the creator's content in general, there's a probability beta sub j that uh, the consumer will like that creator's exclusive content. And their utility from consuming the exclusive content is going to be uh, v sub i minus p sub i, where v is their uh, utility from exclusive content. And this is uh, dependent on uh, the content design, much like Lambda, minus the price that the content creator is charging for that content. Uh, and so if the price is greater than the uh, value that they have for that content, then they are not going to pay for the content. And so even if they roll positive utility, um, they are not going to purchase the content if the price is too high. And then with the remaining probability one minus lambda, there's a mismatch in utility in taste between the consumer and the content creator, in which case that consumer has zero utility for all of that creator's content, and they're going to search again. Uh, so B sub J and beta sub J are uh, heterogeneous and independently realized. Uh, we're going to denote by beta naught uh, the expected uh, prob conditional probability of liking exclusive content. Um, so this is going to be the unconditional mean, I guess, conditional on liking uh, on there being a content match. Uh, ben, can I ask a question on this? So um, you have all kinds of different parameters floating around. And, and so basically Volensky lambda is one, B is zero, beta is one. Um, so, so what is the additional value of having all these other parameters? Or, or so why do you do this? So uh, you might've heard me mention uh, exclusive and public content. Uh, so exclusive content is going to be the content that a creator puts forward in uh, order to facilitate discovery. Um, this is mostly going to be ad financed. Uh, exclusive content uh, is going to be membership based. Mm -hmm. so this is differentiating the two revenue streams that a content creator can have. Our motivation for framing it this way is that in order to access exclusive content, you need to know about a content creator first. Um, so the content creator will put content out on YouTube. Uh, and then you search on YouTube, you find a content creator, you like the, the, the content they're putting on YouTube. At the end of the video, uh, they'll say, hey, uh, if you like this content, check out my Patreon. You can look at the Patreon, see what they're offering there and decide if you like it or not. There's not going to be a perfect correlation between whether you like the public content and uh, the exclusive content that they put on the membership platform. Um, there's nothing stopping a independent content creator who's not operating on any platform and just putting themselves out on forums or uh, talking to friends, uh, other ways of getting content creation out there, their content out there uh, from having both of these revenue streams. Uh, it's just more difficult. So we felt uh, that it made sense to keep the same revenue model when uh, we have uh, creators operating entirely on the outside option. But then the implications for consumers problem are going to be that it should be roughly the same as well. Okay, but, but so, so basically the, 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 here it is about the utility of the consumer and you rationalize these parameters based on the different revenue models that you want to analyze. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yes. 
Um, and, and consumers they have unit demand or, or can they search for many different content providers? Uh, so we currently have unit demand, but that's based primarily on tractability rather than thinking it's a realistic assumption. Um, the, as you can tell, there's already quite a lot going on. Uh, and uh, the model is not the easiest thing to solve. Um, and so allowing for uh, more than unit demand might make it tractable. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, getting to the creator's problem. Uh, so creators are going to be ex ante symmetric, and each creator I is going to choose a design lambda, which is going to be between 0 and 1. Um, so recall that it's the uh, likelihood for a match in taste. Um, the consumer's willingness to pay for exclusive content is also going to be determined by this content design. So VI is going to be a function of lambda. And this is a decreasing and differentiable function. So our interpretation here is that if you have a higher lambda, that's going to be a broader design. Um, so we're thinking of this in terms of a Johnson and Myatt style broad niche axis. Um, and of course, we should emphasize that we're thinking about this in terms of a content production possibilities frontier. Obviously, you could expend more effort and have uh, better, vertically better content. Um, so creator I's per viewer revenue is going to be A naught plus B naught times PI. So A naught here is going to be the ad or sponsorship revenue that they can uh, accrue on their own, plus uh, the intrinsic utility that a content creator gets from putting content out there and having people enjoy it. Uh, and so this A naught here is going to correspond to the BJ here. Uh, and then B naught times PI is their expected revenue for exclusive content. Uh, so that con uh, coincides with the second part of consumer utility. Uh, and there, so they have two decision variables. There's this design variable uh, and then uh, the price that they set for exclusive content. Um, so the platform can operate one or both of the following uh, portals. So a discovery portal is going to lower consumer, sought, consumer search cost to S. Um, so the idea here is that it's easier to search on YouTube's, YouTube for content rather than going on various fan forums or all of the different types of content you might be interested in. Um, they're going to recommend a creator to consumers at every step of the search process. So consumers are only sort of randomly drawn. Uh, the way we're recommend, uh, modeling this recommendation process is via a TUL contest. So the probability that creator I is recommended is going to be this function D of the uh, vector of lambdas on the platform. Uh, and it's going to be uh, lambda sub i taken to the power r divided by all of the lambdas on the platform. Remember, we have a continu uh, continuum of creators, uh, each of them taken to the power r. And r here, which is going to be uh, in this range, which is a set of parameters uh, that is uh, strictly, well, it is uh, weakly positive. Um, that's the recommendation sensitivity. Uh, chosen by the platform. So a higher R means that the platform's recommendation algorithm is more sensitive to the probability that consumers like the content. Uh, the, the platform is going to get per viewer ad revenue A uh, from the advertising, and it's going to raise creators ad revenue to a bar 
So the idea here is that uh, a platform can make it easier for content creators to generate ad revenue because the content creators don't have to directly negotiate with uh, advertisers. And uh, that also raises their visibility overall because they're going to end up with more viewers. The membership platform or membership portal is going to increase the average likelihood that each consumer is interested in accessing exclusive content. Uh, so the idea here is that it's going to be easier to uh, access or pay a content creator if there is a uh, inbuilt uh, platform that you're already operating on. You only have to enter your payment information once. You got a centralized place that you can access all of the exclusive content that you're buying. It's just easier to uh, have this transaction. Uh, and so more consumers are going to be willing to engage in this transaction. And the way a membership portal makes money is that it's charging a transaction commission tau, um, which is ad valorem, on creators' exclusive content. Uh, just a, a quick, um, there's no version of entry, though, from the creators, right? They're all there. So none of this, the incentives don't really change their uh, existence, but only their choice of how they might differentiate, right? Right. Um, we could think of creators. Uh, so creators do have an outside option. Um, that's why we went, uh, we had the introduction talking about what uh, the model as if the platform wasn't there. So they do have an outside option, um, but we don't model a decision not to create at all. Uh, ben, if I can add, um... Maybe I missed this on the consumer part, but uh, how do the consumers find the the in the membership portal the person they like? Because it seems like there has to be discovery there as well. Like, how do I how do yeah. I find this person that makes the stuff that I like? Uh, so it's uh, the way we're modeling it. Uh, my uh, it's gotten much brighter outside. Uh, hopefully, I'm still relatively visible. Um, the, the way we're modeling it is uh, you go through this search process, you see their public content. And then once you've seen their public content, you're also aware of their exclusive content. Um, it's just that there's not a perfect correlation between a match and taste there and a match and taste with the public content. Which is where so the, the is there still like a, this TOLOC contest to, to discover the public content is what I'm wondering. Or is uh, it just known? You just like wake up and you know everything about uh, the the possible set of of uh, ex of uh, people in the membership portal and what they provide. Um, so awareness of a content creator is uh, dependent on the search process. Um, so it's if you know of a content the a creator's exclusive content, you know about their public content. You can't know, not know about one and know about the other. Um, this TOLUC contest is for all of the creators uh, participating on the platform. And so consumers who choose to search on the platform will uh, uh, have recommendation via this TOLUC contest. If uh, consumers choose to search off the platform, then it's standard Walensky search and uh, things are drawn at random. In equilibrium, everyone's going to participate on the platform. Um, this outside option just sets a limit on the platform's uh, behavior. Thanks. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so the way this model ends up working with advertising revenue is that uh, to maximize advertising revenue, uh, the platform is going to want uh, content to be as broad as possible. Uh, one possible critique of 
this model is that if you have targeted advertising, uh, you might think that advertisers with this targeting technology might prefer creators within a specific category. So for example, uh, if I'm a game developer, I might want to target a video game content creator. And I don't necessarily want content that is aiming to be as broad as possible. Um, in our view, that isn't really a problem in the model. Uh, so we're not really thinking of this content design as being a choice of category. M more we're thinking of it as a choice of content design within, within whatever category a content creator is making uh, content. So continuing the example of video games, um, an example of broad content would be something like making top 10 lists. That's very snacky. It's easy to get into, doesn't require much investment. Uh, something that might be very niche would be uh, pure gameplay footage of an obscure indie title. Um, if it's obscure, not that many people are gonna be interested in the first place. Um, if it's just gameplay footage, you're not even talking over it, then uh, there's not a whole lot of value added. That's gonna be very niche. It's gonna require a lot of um, investment on the part of a consumer to be interested in that content. Uh, and then the other piece of modeling that I wanted to discuss is that creators often is um, this decision to model recommendations as a contest. Um, so our motivation here is that creators often complain of having to chase the algorithm. Uh, so figuring out how to uh, design their content in order to get the most recommendations. Um, we know that recommendation algorithms generally prioritize content which maximizes engagement, which in terms of this model would be uh, prioritizing content with a higher lambda. Uh, so we end up with indirect competition in content design, um, but because the uh, algorithm is otherwise fairly opaque from the point of view of creators, um, in, from their point of view, uh, the chance of success is pretty stochastic. Um, and so we have effort dedicated to winning a prize and a stochastic victory probability, which to us sounds a lot like a contest. And if you're gonna be uh, modeling a contest, uh, a total contest is gonna be uh, a good choice because it's tractable and there's a lot of supporting literature uh, about that particular model. Uh, so the timing of the model, uh, the platform chooses its mode of operation. Uh, it's going to set its recommendation design, so R, and its transaction commission, tau, uh, depending on whether it's operating a discovery portal, a membership portal, or both. Uh, creators are going to simultaneously make unbundled participation decisions and choose their content design and exclusive content price. So unbundled here means that uh, if taking YouTube as the example, um, I could uh, make public content on YouTube, but uh, have no exclusive content on YouTube and put that on my website. Or I could only make uh, membership content on YouTube and try and advertise that elsewhere on uh, fan forums. Uh, so unbundled here means you don't have to participate in both portals. Consumers are going to observe the platform's decisions, but they're not going to observe the decisions of individual creators. Uh, and then based on these decisions, they're going to choose whether and where to search. And our solution concept here is perfect Bayesian equilibrium. Uh, and we're going to assume that creators are choosing symmetric strategies. Uh, so, uh, in the consumer creator sub game, uh, we're going to talk about the equilibrium and hybrid mode. Uh, the equilibrium outside of hybrid mode ends up being very similar. It's just uh, some of the outcomes end up being uh, parameters rather than uh, um, the platform's decision. 
So each creator is going to join the platform in Fluogram. They're going to set uh, their content design uh, in order to maximize this function here. And they're going to set their exclusive content price equal to the value defined by their content design. Each consumer is going to believe that all creators adopt strategy um, lambda p, uh, and they're going to initiate search if uh, their uh, intrinsic utility for public content times lambda h is greater than the search cost. So this is the condition that uh, it makes sense to search once. And because uh, we have a stationary search problem, if it makes sense to search once, it makes sense to keep searching until you have found a match. Uh, consumers are going to optimally follow the platform's recommendation at every step. And they're going to search through the platform until they find a positive match, again, a po uh, stationary search problem. Therefore, the mass of searchers is going to be the probability that this utility is greater than S divided by lambda H, which for notational convenience, we're going to call G of lambda H over S. The reasoning for this equilibrium, uh, each creator's profit is proportional to uh, consumer participation times the probability of being recommended times the probability of a taste match times the margin. Uh, assuming the price is less than the value. Uh, because each creator is part of a continuum, they aren't going to influence search decisions. They're not going to uh, influence the denominator here. So uh, the function that they are maximizing is uh, the product of this uh, numerator here times the taste match times the margin, which is this function. And then because V is homogeneous across consumers, it's just based on the creator's content design, that's going to imply that the price is equal to the value. Uh, moving up to the platform's decisions, um, the platform is in equilibrium going to be determining the design and the mass of searchers. So uh, with a hybrid platform, lambda h is going to be arcmax of this, and this is going to be the uh, consumer participation. With a pure discovery platform, uh, the platform is still determining the recommendation sensitivity, but it is not operating membership portal. So uh, rather than the creator's margin being one minus tau times beta times V of lambda, it's just beta naught times V of lambda. Uh, but because the creators have this outside option, um, the creator's participation constraint is going to be that one minus tau times beta bar is greater than or equal to beta naught. Uh, this means that they get at least weekly higher exclusive content revenue in the hybrid equilibrium than they do with the pure discovery platform. Uh, because they're getting higher exclusive content revenue, they're going to decrease the broadness of their design, uh, assuming R is constant which means that fewer consumers are going to visit the platform because lambda h is less than lambda d. Uh, and so uh, this g is going to go down. Uh, now, if we compare the platform profit, uh, in pure discovery mode, uh, the platform is maximizing consumer participation times its ad revenue. In hybrid mode, uh, you have, uh, for any given R, less consumer participation. But uh, there's also this additional revenue stream, which is the platform's take on uh, exclusive content. Uh, so you could, uh, so just looking at it, the comparison is ambiguous. Uh, our first main result is that profit is higher and uh, 
content design is weakly more niche with a hybrid platform than a peer discovery platform. And the reasoning here is that because there's this new source for platform revenue, uh, the platform can always set tau equal to uh, the participation constraint for content creators and set r equal to the r that it would set in peer discovery mode, it would replicate the profit that uh, a uh, peer discovery, uh, the it would replicate the advertising profit that the peer discovery platform gets. And it has this additional revenue stream. So it's always gonna be more profitable. Um, but it's also going to want to set a less sensitive recommendation uh, system in equilibrium to try and increase this other revenue stream, because recall, uh, v is decreasing in lambda so uh, in a peer discovery mode the platform is always going to set the maximum sensitivity it can in hybrid mode it is going to set at least a weekly lower recommendation sensitivity just so you know you have uh nine minutes okay uh i might end up skipping over uh competition um so uh, with peer membership versus hybrid, uh, you end up having a uh, similar comparison, except that uh, we have an increase in uh, advertising revenue and increased competition for recommendations. Uh, creators are going to set uh, weekly uh, sorry, they're actually going to increase the broadness of their content design, holding tau constant, and we're going to end up with more visiting consumers uh, because the search cost is lower. Uh, platform's profit maximization is going to be uh, a similar trade-off. They have uh, increased uh, consumer participation and they have this new uh, revenue stream but you end up with uh, at least weekly broader content, which is going to lower the membership revenue. Uh, the profit comparison here is not as clean. Um, so what we end up with is the profit of a hybrid is greater than membership profit if and only if the platform's advertising revenue A is greater than some threshold A1. Uh, and this threshold is decreasing in S. And the reason for this is that we end up with a distraction effect on creators. So uh, creators are choosing a broader design due to recommendation competition and ad revenue, uh, which means that a hybrid platform is sometimes not able to in induce the content design that it would want. If the platform is relying heavily on this transaction commission, so if the advertising revenue stream is fairly small, then advertising and adding a discovery portal is actually going to be unprofitable. And we actually have a real world example of this kind of reasoning. So in 2019, Patreon published a blog post labeled, why isn't Patreon a discovery platform? And their argument was that adding a discovery component would force creators to design content to appeal to the algorithm, which they described as getting in between creators and patrons. Um, and so they instead uh, want a business that is focused on high value relationships between creators and small audience versus numerous low value creators or viewers, um, which is exactly the trade off that is being described by our model. So if a platform's revenue is transaction focused, then a discovery por portal can actually hurt more than it helps. So uh, in terms of content design, if the commission is fixed, then we end up with uh, narrow, uh, broader content in hybrid compared to a membership. But because the hybrid platform is trying to uh, induce uh, broader content design, potentially, um, because of the limitations on R, uh, it might actually set a lower content commission and because the search cost is lower, it does not have to have a uh, higher content commission in order to do, induce broader design and induce uh, consumer participation. And so we might actually end up with a lower tau, um, a tau so much lower that you end up with narrower content. 
Uh, and this is going to happen if A is very small. Uh, so if A is small, then you end up with, uh, sorry, uh, if A is larger than some threshold, then you're going to end up with broader content in equilibrium with a hybrid platform compared to a monopoly. Sorry, compared to a peer membership. Um, and then in all three modes, the uh, broadness of content is going to decrease as consumer search costs decrease. Um, this is reminiscent of Bar Isaac et al, but in our setup, set, setup, search costs don't have a direct effect on creators' design. Instead, it's because lower search costs means more visiting consumers, uh, which means that the platform is going to choose a recommendation scheme and commission that induce more niche content design. Uh, check the time. Uh, I think I am I'm just about yeah, Well, we started a little late. You have four minutes. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to quickly go over this. Um, so with multiple platforms, uh, I'm just going to go over the uh, baseline here. Uh, we start with homogenous platforms. Each content creator is going to make a single content design decision. And then creators are going to mix and match in their participation decisions. And we have free multi -home. Uh So timing is a little bit different. The platforms are just going to act simultaneously. So they're going to choose their mode of operation simultaneously, and then they're going to make their recommendation sensitivity and uh, content commissions simultaneously. Uh, in the equilibrium, uh, we're going to end up with creators joining both discovery portals, if any are being operated. They're going to join the membership portal with the lowest commission, and consumers are going to search on the discovery portal with the highest recommendation sensitivity, and they're going to use the membership portal of their matched creator. Um, so uh, our main proposition here is in terms of best responding business modes. So when a competing platform strategy include, uh, includes a membership portal, it is never a best response to operate a competing membership portal. So if we compare to the monopoly place, um, going pure discovery to hybrid is unprofitable if the opponent operates a membership portal. The intuition here is that when you have competition between homogenous membership portals, competition is going to lead to a very low exclusive content commission, which means that the platforms are gonna be relying on ad, lib, ad, ad revenue. But because of the very low content commission, you're gonna end up having niche, more niche design which is going to lead to a negative spillover from the transaction commission to ad revenue, because when creators choose a niche design, you end up with fewer visiting consumers. And because you're selling eyeballs, um, you're going to end up with lower total ad revenue. So it's not just unprofitable, or it's not just revenue neutral, it actually reduces profit. Uh, and then suppose operating a discovery portal involves a fixed cost. Um, so this has been an assumption we were making throughout the paper. It's just that it didn't have any bite until now. Um, there's going to be a threshold uh, A sub 3, such that in the overall equilibrium of two platforms, uh, if you have a less than A sub 3, you're going to end up with pure discovery mode and pure membership mode. If you have a greater than this threshold, you're going to end up with one pure discovery platform and a hybrid platform. Um, and so the reasoning here is pretty simple. Um, the distraction effect is going to be absent because you're always going to have one uh, pure discovery platform. And so um, in a sense, the distract distraction effect is always there. And this decision for the second platform here doesn't change uh, exclusive content uh, revenue. So the decision of whether to add a discovery portal is going to be comparing this fixed cost C versus the platform revenue A over two, where this uh, A over two is due to competition. So if A over two is greater than C, you add a uh, discovery portal. Um, we have some extensions. Uh, the mostly don't change anything. Um, horizontally differentiated platforms, we can end up with multiple uh, membership portals in equilibrium, uh, but I don't really have time to go over that. I'd be happy to discuss it uh, later. Um, 
I think I'm going to skip over the literature review. The main thing is that uh, compared to the main media platforms, uh, we have information be intermediation between consumers and content creators. Um, content creators are gen user generated content. So we're going to have uh, comparison uh, of business models and direct monetization, monetization of viewers, which is mostly not in the UGC literature. Uh, and if we look at business models of media platforms, which is what Simon was talking about earlier, um, the new thing in this paper is the focus on this membership component versus uh, pay TV to access all of the content with no advertising. Uh, there's some other related papers, but I'm low on time, so I'm just going to go to the conclusion. Um, so we have a model that is looking at implications of business model decisions by platforms for the content creation market. Um, in this model, we have endogenous content design and a recommendation scheme. Uh, moving from pure discovery mode to hybrid mode, it's going to be profitable for a monopoly platform, unprofitable if an undifferentiated rival membership portal exists because of this negative spillover effect. Uh, and equilibrium content design is going to be more niche. Moving from pure membership mode to hybrid mode, you end up with a distraction effect, which means that it may be unprofitable for a monopoly platform to go to, into hybrid mode. But this distraction effect is going to be irrelevant if a rival discovery portal exists. And the effect on equilibrium content design is going to be ambiguous. It depends on uh, the amount of advertising revenue available to the platform. And then with multiple platforms, uh, we're going to end up with strategic differentiation in business models in order to avoid direct competition. Thank you. That moment I can't find my mouse. Thank you for a great presentation. Uh, we now open it up for questions. Uh, so, oh no, never mind. Sorry. No, I was just going to say that I was very impressed on how many uh, elements you brought together there, and indeed, I was, um, I think, familiar with some of the submodules, but it's taking me a while to fix my thoughts and think about what I do remember about, I don't know. Tele competition, um, yeah. For, and so I was just to say in those terms, I was uh, thinking about sort of reference points and how they fit together. And um, it might just in terms of a presentation, I don't know. I would have found it easier, I think, if you'd had a flow diagram, something like an MBA text of what the modules are and what the assumptions and how they fit together. And this is probably sort of um, is too big an ask, but uh, I sort of was thinking, gee, how would this thing on its own work? Or how would this part work? And uh, while I was wondering about that, I didn't put together the big picture, but I was uh, amazed you did so. For example, on the Tulloch thing, I was getting hung up that for some values of R, there's no, but the thing isn't an equilibrium. That's one of the criticisms of Tulloch that he gets, looks at the first order condition gets over. And then at some point I realized, oh, you're gonna get around that with a mon comp assumption. And just to say that I was trying to figure all these things out and you were somewhere. Another one there is you talk about game timing and sort of who observes what, when. And I know I've struggled through uh, a lot of those uh, issues in media economics and they substantially changed the answers, et cetera. So I, um, and again, you did so much there with so many pieces. I uh, didn't have a chance to sort of figure out, gee, what would happen if we relax some of these informational requirements, um, stuff like that. So uh, 
I think maybe uh, Dan has a more substantive comment, but I'm just sort of, <laughs> you know more where the bodies are buried here. I was surprised, you know, what it is in the timing and assumption that makes it work, because this could uh, face plant very easily. And you're endogenizing uh, every which direction, it seems like, okay, you put in so many things and they come out, you come out with answers. So all that is admirable, but I, I don't have a full feeling of how the pieces have all fit together and how you've managed to make it work, which is uh, probably an unanswerable question, but uh, you know, I'm just sort of wondering what happens down some of these other paths you haven't explored. Uh, thanks, I, I guess the uh, answer to the broad question is uh, about two years and a brilliant co-author. Um, yeah, we've had to do a lot of experimentation with this model, but uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot going on and it's hard to fit into an hour. Uh, we, I will say, uh, if you find yourself with time to read the paper, uh, it we do discuss some of the uh, other roads we went down. Um, so that might answer some of the questions. So that wasn't actually my question, but I, I also had a similar challenge where individually each of your statements I, I was tracking, but the cohesive model, it was very hard for me to think because of all the different things you've stacked together, essentially what's the key factors, but that, that wasn't my question, but I, I definitely found that to be a challenge with this paper because it, it required me to think on a few dimensions I don't always think on. Um, more so just thinking about which markets these best fit like if you take twitch for example there are some streamers that are just massive and then others that are very dispersed similar youtube similar all of them um should we be concerned about some of your assumptions because for some of the areas of course you've got these huge movers and, and more not not whether you've considered it but just what you think the consequences are i know you mentioned it but um, yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I did have to go over this uh, fairly quickly. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad you came back to that. Um, so if you end up with asymmetric creators, um, the results mostly don't change if we uh, change that alone. Um, that said, we are thinking about endogenizing ad revenue. Um, so that might have an implication for, if we were to put those two together, which because of how complicated this model is, that might not be uh, uh, entirely tractable. Um, but uh, if we were to put those two together, what you might end up with is, uh, these massive content creators focusing more on broad content in order to uh, use the fact that their larger audiences are more valuable for advertisers. Um, and uh, is for... that what you would get if you introduced prominence? So I, I'm somewhat thinking size, but I'm also thinking maybe you're outside of the competition because hmm. you're featured or because people know how to get to you without going through the competition. I'm, I, I, no, this isn't for your current paper. This is just a... No, that's a good thought. Uh, in terms of the current model, you would end up with the featured creator, assuming we don't have endogenous ad revenue. Uh, so in the current model, you would end up with the featured creator having more niche content. Um, Which would be odd. Yeah. Um, I, I would, I, I think that's interesting and, and honestly might be worth then thinking about whether that's passing kind of a plausibility test. Because that is, I, I see which, I see where you're getting that, but that, that worries me a little bit. Um, I get where it's coming from though in, in your model. Um, so, I think it would be ambiguous with endogenous ad revenue. I think that result would be more interesting uh, with the endogenous ad revenue uh, extension. And I think 
having a prominent creator, then that would be a bit more uh, tractable. Because uh, you wouldn't necessarily have to put the asymmetric creators and the endogenous ad revenue together. Thank you for a great presentation. I'm going to stop the recording here that we can continue chatting.